What's up guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Kevin. This is my first YouTube video and thank you for tuning in. For those of you who don't know me, my passion and pleasures are baseball, fitness, and nutrition. I wanna start this channel so I can spread knowledge and wisdom to players and coaches of all levels. Because this is my first video, I wanna quickly introduce myself. I played at a JUCO in New York and then I transferred to Fisher College, a D1 program in Boston. I started off as a catcher and then I transitioned to a pitcher. Just like everyone else, I hit adversity. In 2017, I tore my UCL, my right hand side, and I had Tommy John surgery on August 23rd. Throughout my life, I've met top tier coaches, players, and professionals who have helped increase my knowledge in the game. After my playing years, I decided to join the Queensboro Community College baseball program, and I am now the assistant baseball coach there. My number one goal is player development in the collegiate and youth atmosphere. I also want to help influence players in the physical and mental aspect of the game, and unlock their optimal potential within. Please watch until the end of the video. I was able to get on the horn with Coach Liam Bowen, who is the head baseball coach at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. UMBC is a D1 program, and Coach Liam was kind enough to share his keys to success, leadership, player recruiting process, and how to add value to a team. So let's jump right in. Uh, so I think every coach has to define that for himself before he even speaks to his team the first time uh, him or herself, I mean, I don't think it's different between male and female sports or really in any organization at our place at UMBC, the things that we talk to our guys about that we hammer uh, every day. And uh, we take pride in our just selflessness and reliability. You know, I'm, I'm, my own belief is that if we nail those two things, then everything else is going to fall into place. So, like I said, that's going to be, I think, individual program to program, coach to coach. But for us at our place, those are the two that we really focus on. Yeah, I love it. Uh, same thing with us at Queensboro, you know, commitment and efficiency and being positive about everything that you're doing. Just having that kind of being mentally tough and mentally strong throughout the season. Sure. I love sure. It. It, it, yeah, and I, I think it really helps to be specific with with young guys and what, what we're looking for. Um, in those areas are really defining those terms for them, uh, which is something we work hard on. You know, I like, I like the, the term commitment, you know, I think is great. And I think to really get the most out of your, your group and get them to, to learn the, you know, the, the most deeply about that. It, it, it's a constant um, uh, effort to continue to define that term for them and, and give them examples of what that's supposed to look like in our context. So when it comes to selflessness and reliability, that's what we try and do. Awesome. I love it. And I know that you said that you have a workout in about 30 minutes or so, and that actually leads into my next question, which is awesome. So it obviously depends on the time of year. Um, I can give you maybe like a, today's practice is actually a little bit atypical. It's a, not a great weather day uh, down here. It's pretty cold. So mm -hmm. um, uh, our normal routine is, um, is a little bit changed, but so, what I would uh, kind of give you for a typical day is the first thing that our guys do every day is get up and go to class. Um, I'm a big believer in the value of sleep. I'm not a big believer in the value of waking them up really early in the morning. If we can avoid it, we do it here and there, but it's, it's something we were trying to be really judicious with. So uh, by 9 a.m., basically everybody on our team is either in class or in study halls if they're part of our study hall program and don't have class at that time. Um, and then most days uh, we lift at noon, um, and actually we lift uh, really frequently during the uh, during the season. We lift almost every weekday. There's a whole uh, kind of a philosophy and structure to that. And then we uh, start early work most days on the field at 1:45. Is when we start taking groups. Uh, sometimes it's earlier if you know we have something specific we want to do with a specific guy. The team segment of practice starts at 2.45, and then we try and, you know, once again be judicious with the time that the whole team is out there. You know, I think it becomes a grind at our level how often, you know, we have to go and be at the field. So if, you know, we can get done what we need to get done with the whole group in an hour, then we'll just go an hour with the whole group, and then after that we'll have some remaining skill groups that will stay behind and get some more either small group or one-on-one -on -one coaching from their position coach. Um, and we're usually, usually everybody's walking away from the field by 530. You know, if, 
if we get it done right. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's some next level, next level stuff right there. Um, do you guys have any off days? Yes, the uh, the NCAA mandates that we have one off day per week. We take Monday off during the season, and then on Thursdays for us, we get we still lift, but uh, the on field um, skill stuff is a good bit shorter. Uh, we just try and build in, uh, you know, some some breathers for the guys. You know, we're we're playing four and five games a week for 13 weeks. Uh, I, I think it's easy to just kind of bring your team out and hit another BP over and over and over again. And I just don't, I don't believe that there's uh, a return on investment there when it comes to our time. So, um, you know, we, we kind of repurpose that time and put those guys in the weight room and and let our strength coach do uh, what he can do to help those guys recover from what, what we've been doing on the field and then get ready for the weekend that's coming up. Great question. So we have we do captains slightly differently than I think a lot of people do. We do a captain in each class. So we have four captains, one senior, one junior, one sophomore, one freshman. And the idea there is we want the best representative from each class, uh, and we also want to you know continue to kind of grow leadership across the program from a uh, a time standpoint. We don't want to concentrate all the leadership. Uh, in one graduating class and then have to build it from scratch when those guys are gone. So uh, with those guys, uh, we actually, over winter break, we, we assigned them the book Captain's Class by Sam Walker, which I think if you if you really want to get into the, the nuts and bolts of this question is a great read. And it's basically a study of the, the most successful captains in the history of team sports. And I'll try and sum it up really quick. There's obviously there's a lot to it that I won't mention, but the – the, the gist of it is the kind of, you know, Disney sports movie uh, vision of a captain where the, the guy's really charismatic and gives big speeches and, and things of that type. That's not really how it works at the highest level. The, the captains are the guys who are the most selfless, first and foremost, the guys who are most dedicated to the team and the guys who are the most connected to their teammates, really the most empathetic guys, the guys who are constantly looking out for the – um, the, the betterment of the group rather than focusing on themselves. And that's basically what we try and pump into these guys. You know, to me, a real leader is a guy who it takes the, the group success personally and doesn't take his, you know, personal success um, as seriously as that. So that's probably the main thing I would say that we look for. And, and, and Kevin, I could not be a bigger fan of reading and trying to preach it to these young guys like, I just think that if you're, I mean, there's a lot of value in reading beyond, you know, any kind of competitive situation, but if you're involved in a competitive enterprise and your opponents are reading and you are not like, they are going to find a way to use that against you and take you apart. I mean, if you're the, I, I, I've told our guys this for a long time, that if, if you get through college and the only thing you're an expert on is your own experience, that's a sad state of affairs. You know, you have to really, pump other people's experience and ideas into you and the best way to do that is reading. So um, good for you to, to get those guys at Queensboro reading and thinking about, you know, their purpose and what you guys are doing together, uh, you know, in a, in a little broader sense. I think that's really good. Uh, it's, it's everything. I mean, that's, you know, the connectivity between everybody in the program is going to determine, you know, kind of the height of your success. So uh, I think, any minutes or hours you invest in communication are well spent. I, I guess the, the biggest thing that, um, you know, I would, I would say as a head coach is really important. The two biggest things I would say is number one, to, to just be really, really approachable. I mean, you know, the, the kind of the end of the roster freshman guy who's just kind of fighting for his place on the team. He's got to feel really comfortable walking up to you and sharing what's on his mind because otherwise you're never going to have a, a genuine relationship with him. Um, and I just think the more you can, and it's those, it's those small pieces of communication, right? Just asking guys how they're doing, asking them about their families, you know, sharing a, a joke with them before practice, you know, just, just being an approachable person. I think there's a ton of value in that. And what kind of goes along with that, my second thing, is just trusting yourself to find the right words, you know, to to really, I mean, I think that's, 
that's just your value as a coach. It's that's kind of what what the uh, you, it's not that different from playing. You got to kind of trust your ability to do your job, and a lot of times your job is you you get put in a communication kind of situation where um, you're not. It, it's impossible to prepare for, and you just have to trust your your values and your instincts to deliver the right message, rather than try and kind of step away and make sure you don't make a mistake because that's just going to in my mind, lead to a less communication and and a not as positive an outcome. So yeah, those would be my two things, man. Just keep the walls down, and, and if you're a coach, you just got to trust yourself and know that as long as you're, you know, uh, keeping your values in mind every time you speak to the players, you, you can't lose. Awesome, awesome. And you talked about different um, phrases and words that you use. What kind of phrases do you use throughout the day? Uh, I mean, obviously, it depends on the situation. Um, I'm sure our players would be able to tell you a few things they've heard multiple times. You know, some, some catchphrases uh, around our program. Uh, I wish I wish that one of them was on the phone. I'm sure they could they could fill you up with a few of them. I'm like everybody else. You know, I got a few things I go to. But uh, one of the things, um, you know, we just talk about is how fortunate we are. You know, like we're. We're getting, you know, we're like every other program, you know, there are things that you could look at our facility or look at our, our situation or whatever and say, oh, you know, this could be better, that could be better. But at the end of the day, like, we're at a great university, we get to play the greatest game in the world, um, you know, we get to do it with this awesome group of guys that we have here, this 2020 season, a group that I really enjoy and that really enjoys each other. You know, at a certain point, what do you want? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what's, like, what's, uh, what, what, what do you expect out of this world? I think... Uh, you know, that's something that we talk about a lot is just our privilege and good fortune and, you know, making sure that we don't waste it. So uh, I love that. I love that. If, if I had to pick one, that might be it, but, but man, there are plenty. There's a, there's a lot of go-tos. Uh, the players do it more than we do. <laughs> oh, no doubt. Well, yeah. Like those guys, um, sometimes, and you know, you're doing it right. I think as a coach, when the things that are important to you that you that you say, you hear them kind of saying it to each other, and it becomes part of the kind of the currency of your program. And you know that's that's when you kind of you know the message is landing, and and everybody's in the right mindset or in the mindset that you're, that you're trying to create anyway. So um, that's always a fun process. Yeah, I agree. Something that I catch myself saying. There's two things actually. It's step by step. I mean, we're JUCO, so we're all about player development. So it's step by step by step. Get your approach down, get your mechanics down, get your mind right, step by step by step, and then you become that uh, four-year player that, I mean, every player sure. that we're kind of get in contact with wants to get to that four-year program. And then my next kind of phrase is 5%. Become 5% better than you were last week, whatever that is, whether that's more reps in the weight room, more reps swinging, maybe picking up the trash from the dugout, better 5% in your lifestyle outside of baseball, whatever that might be. But, you know, you're a person first before a ball player. Sure. So sure. How you, how you are as a person off the field is how you're going to be on the field. Sure. No, I, th- I think that's great. And, and, you know, I think you got to find the stuff that's authentic to you, you know, that you can deliver with some real credibility. The couple that, you know, I've, as I've been racking my brain as we've been talking about this, um, I'll give you one that I say and the one that our, our lead assistant says that I think is really good. I've kind of adopted. Uh, the one I say is, you know, is a lot of things in what we do are yes or no. And I think sometimes um, the in the players' lives, they everything becomes kind of shades of gray. It's like, well, you tried hard, but um, and, and you didn't quite get there, but there's all this to show for it. And, and I think at a certain point, your the discipline of, of yes and no questions really helps. So I'll, I've gotten in front of our team plenty of times to say, hey, look, you know, today's a yes or a no. Are we advancing ourselves towards our goals, which obviously here every year is winning a championship, or are we taking a, a, a step away from that? And just, I think, constantly framing things in those terms where they have to be accountable to themselves and each other, I think that's really important. So um, yeah, certain things, they're, they're, they're just yes or no, and and, um, and we say that a good bit. And then the one our, our assistant says that I think is great is um, – he just talks all the time about adding value. You know, you, you, you'll hear him always say, "Hey, you got to find a way to add value um, t- t- today." And that, and that, that kind of goes to what you're saying, going beyond, you know, whatever your box score says, or maybe it's it's not your day to pitch, and you just got to find a way to add value. And if you're not adding value, 
then you're not earning your place in this very privileged situation that, you know, we're a part of. So uh, that's, those are a couple more for you. I'm sure if, if we had more time, I could keep going and going and going because there's plenty of them. But um, those are the couple that kind of jumped into my mind. I like the add value part. Definitely going to start incorporating it there, here and there. So my uh, yeah, awesome. it's, a, it, it's a great mindset to have these guys in, man. Like, you know, if, if, if everybody on your team shows up to the field and says, you know, instead of saying, oh, I want to get two hits today or, or I want to, you know, punch out eight guys or whatever, they just think, hey, look, I'm, I'm just trying to add value to the – to UMBC baseball today. I'm going to find a way to add value. Whatever opportunity I get to add value, whether it's to, you know, get a big hit or or work a chart or, you know, just pour myself into my teammate and try and get him in a better state of mind, like I'm just going to find a way to add value. Like that like that's that that's what we're after. You know, it's no secret and I just think it's a great way of putting it. Uh, you know, it, it's a good question. I'm not sure our sport is terribly conducive to that. Like, I don't think, um, you know, it's not a sport where, you know, additional effort is necessarily rewarded by success. You know, it, it, if the players are giving effort, then I don't think, you know, it, it necessarily a big speech about kind of digging deep and, and, and pushing on is, is necessarily called for. I think, the the biggest thing that we can do whether we're succeeding or or not succeeding in any given game is just stay steadfastly focused on our plan and our process and i think as the head coach that's what you or anybody on the coach staff that's what you have to project if 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 the coaches are a roller coaster where you know when it's going good and we're you know we're swinging it well and our guys rolling on the mound like we're, we're we act one way and then when things are going against us, we act another way. You, the, the team is always just going to be a function of its circumstance, and that's not characteristic of championship teams. So if, if you, I think if you really want to hold the players to a standard of performance where regardless of the situation, they're going to perform at a certain level, I think it's got to come from a certain just consistency and unflappability in the coaching staff. Like I, I just think – our sport doesn't really reward a lot of, you know, emotional swings in the leadership. I just, I just really don't believe in that at all. So if we're down in a game and, and things aren't going our way, you know, I might pull a couple guys aside and say, Hey, look, you know, it, it, it doesn't look good on the scoreboard right now, but here's what I like about our process. Here's what I think we can change to turn things in our favor and just keep it really nuts and bolts. And then if it's an effort question, that's different. That's when you got to round your team up and, um, and find a way to get more out of them. But if it's a, if, if what we're doing just isn't working, then I think we got to keep it um, really practical because I think when the emotional piece gets involved, you know, that's, that, that's a rest long-term, that's a recipe for mediocrity. I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of coaches have that football kind of mentality where it's the raw raw kind of speeches and then players get too excited they get aggressive they over swing over throw and that's what you know maybe they're close in the game and now they're kind of separating themselves from where they were close now they're far apart from actually winning sure. yeah no no uh, I, I totally agree and and you know if, if you if, if your guys can't provide energy and and can't get um you know up to play baseball then like just need new guys. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like, like I think it, 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 we can we can find nine guys to run out there that are going to deliver energy and enthusiasm and effort for each other. Like that's that's pretty meets requirements. Um, if you find yourself coaching that, I think it, you're looking at more of a personnel issue than anything else. So, um, you know, we're just real clear with the guys at the beginning of the year. I mean, I tell them all the um, all in September. Say, hey, look, like I'm not. You know, we'll motivate you here and there, but at the end of the day, your 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 day to day motivation has to come from looking around our locker room and saying these guys deserve my best effort. And if it's got to come from the coaching staff every day, once in a while maybe, but if it's got to come from the coaching staff every day, we're in a bad spot and we're not going to be very successful. Uh, well, the 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 first thing that we look for and somehow this this continues to get kind of lost in translation is they have to be a dominant player at their level for us to really be interested and i think 
uh, as particularly from the high school level as as um you know summer teams have have kind of multiplied and there are more and more opportunities for younger players to play in front of college coaches you know i can just say for us as a division 1 program we're not interested in anybody that isn't an absolutely dominant high school baseball player um you know i i, I just think a lot of guys kind of get the cart before the horse and think, well, if I can show something one time in front of this college coach, then, you know, that's that's going to give me an opportunity. And really, you know, we're going to dig into your background and figure out, well, is this guy deciding games at the high school level? And if he isn't, then that's a major, major red flag. You know, I, I if we were going to recruit a, a junior college player from your region, coach, you know, we would expect that guy to be having a lot of success for you. You know, because naturally coming to our level would be a step up in competition. So uh, that's that's the first thing. And then what'll um, what'll turn us off a player are if we uh, you know maybe start to communicate with the player, you know, phone or text, and the guy just isn't a, an energetic uh, presence in in you know either of those. Um, kind of mediums like that, that's a big red flag so you got to have guys who are going to be giving energy off uh you know every day i mean we have them for for four years and that's a long time to to try and drag energy out of somebody so that's a big one and then obviously uh, it probably should have said it first the academic piece if a guy isn't disciplined enough to take care of his academics in high school or junior college it's a major major red flag um you know it's just it's just somebody who's not not real consistent you know, meeting their obligations, and, you know, that's not something that we can deal with. Well, it's, to develop as a ball player, it's a, a couple of things. Um, number one, I would say you need to you need to study the level of baseball you're playing. You need to figure out what your team needs, and you need to find a way to improve yourself in that way because I'm, I'm a huge, huge believer in you have to be focused on what's in front of you, and if what's in front of you – is trying to help your high school baseball team, you know, win a conference championship or a state championship, you have to invest all of yourself in that. You know, it can't be a deal where it's, you know, I'm going to do something that, you know, might um, help the high school team, but uh, really I'm I'm doing it with an eye towards developing for, for college. I, I just don't believe in that. I think eventually, you know, the people who have winning habits, um, they're eventually rewarded. And the second thing I would say is, uh, you gotta find a um, uh, just just find a, a a way for you to kind of continue to unlock different parts of the sport. And you know we're in the year 2020 now, so you know that can be going on YouTube, studying the best in the game. That can be uh, reading about it, like we talked about. Um, you know, finding some people in your life who can uh, give you some some good development guidance. Um, those would be the two things that that I would really focus on is kind of help whatever team you're playing for now. Don't get lost in the the future and uh, try and just be as curious as possible about your craft. Uh, read and talk to as many smart people as you can. You know, those were the things that helped me the most. Um, I, you know, you were a guy that just reached out to me and asked for some, some of uh, my time and I was happy to give it to you because there was a time years ago where I was in a situation probably similar to yours and I was fortunate that other people were generous to me. And that's something that I'm always eager, you know, to pay forward and, and try. And there's, there's so many more people out there like that than, than the opposite. You know, there's a ton of people out there who will be gracious and giving of their time and, and expertise. And I've been lucky to know enough of them that they've made me a lot smarter. And then, the second thing is you just got to read. I mean, there, there's no substitute for it. Like, um, I think sometimes we can get fooled into thinking we're learning stuff in these short videos on Twitter or what have you. And, and what, what, what really wins in, in our business is a, a depth of knowledge, not a breadth of knowledge. Like, you got to know your subject matter really deeply. And if all you have is like a collection of 30 second videos, like that, that that's not going to give you the depth you need. So I think you got to have those in depth conversations and. You know, for me, the best way to to learn something deeply is to to read about it and really sit with it for a while. So, I'd recommend both of those. Uh, I think, kind of going back to what I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm pretty nuts and bolts. 
um, you know, with, with the guys. Like, I, I just try and be really blunt and really honest with them in a really respectful way. You know, one thing that I think helped me a ton as a coach is um, starting when I was working in Division Two. This is, gosh, years ago. It's like 2011. I stopped swearing at work. And everybody's different, but that's something that I would really advise because um, – it just allowed me to communicate so much more directly with our players and have that less, that message land with them. You know, I'm not a guy who's going to raise his voice a ton or be demeaning to a guy, but I'm a guy who's going to tell the truth as I see it all the time. And I think, you know, the, 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 the guys in our program uh, eventually come to respect that because they know they're going to be shot straight. And that's a big part of the coaching style. And then I would say the other part of it that's really important to me is, is just talking about values um, with our guys on a daily basis and, and, and trying to connect what we do uh, as, a, as a baseball team to our values as a group and each guy's values individually. Because the, the honest truth is, you know, whether we win 25, 30, or 35 ball games this year, you know, the wor- it, it's important to us and, and, and we treat it as really important, but the world's going to keep turning. You know, it, it, the thing that's much, much more important to me is that these guys – create a set of values that they can use the rest of their lives to, to make the biggest impact on the people around them that they can, you know, that's, that's what we're really playing for in the end. So we, we try and keep our focus on that as a group um, and then try and keep the, the communication really direct and really honest and, and um, really caring, you know, not being demeaning to anybody and not, you know, never going to be cussing guys out or anything like that. Uh, well, we're, we're, you know, we work hard every day on that for sure, separating ourselves from our competition, obviously. And I would say the thing that um, if I had to point to one or, or maybe a couple would be the, the focus on relationships and player development. I would say that's the biggest thing. Um, we, one of the reasons I love working here is, is we're kind of, we're, we're so um, in concert with my own values where, you know, I grew up in a family like most families where we, we didn't have everything under the sun. There were things we couldn't afford, but we always prioritized. My parents did an awesome job at this, always prioritized the way that we treated each other and, and the time that we made for each other. And that, that's, that's our program. I mean, there are other places where they've got a, a newer stadium or more gear, or some more bells and whistles, and they're always going to have that. And that's fine. You know, we, we want to be the best program in, at, at the country at, connecting with each other and making sure that um, those bonds are as strong as they possibly can be. So I, I would say that kind of that personal touch at our place, like college baseball, you know, sometimes people tell me it's a business. I, I always come back with, it's a family business. Like there's a difference between working for a corporation and then working for like a mom and pop store. And we're, we're kind of more of that mom and pop type of feel, uh, which I really enjoy. And um, like I said, I think it's um, something that, lines up really well with kind of my experience and my values. Good question. Teachable story. Um, gosh, there's a couple that come to mind. I, I want to just, I don't want to ramble. I, I want to just give you one. Um, I think, uh, I, 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 I think what I would tell you is I'm, I'm a big believer in the value of, of plans more than the value of goals. I mean, we have some unspoken goals here. Like we're, you know, we maybe mentioned it once, like, hey, look, we're trying to win a championship. Well, I don't think anybody's confused about that. We spend so much more time on well, what are we planning to do today to move us forward. And, uh, you know, when I got here uh, as an assistant in 2012, we were one of the bottom five teams in the country in RPI, and we went 10 and 42 uh, my first year. And we were really fortunate to get the 10. Um, you know, I felt – felt like we, we maybe even overachieved a little bit to win 10, if you can believe it. So um, we had a long way to go. And by 2015, we were 34 and 20. We were the most improved uh, team in the United States or most improved pitching staff in the United States. And we uh, were uh, a game away from winning a conference championship. We ended up winning it in, in 2017, a little bit later. And I'll, I'll distinctly remember, I won't tell you who we were playing, um, but I, I distinctly remember we were playing a, a team that we played regularly that, that usually had their way with us when we weren't, um, you know, very good. And um, we it was an, an, an even game in the early innings. And one of our players, one of our seniors, looked at me that year and he just said, Coach, these guys can't stay with us. Like, 
like we're better than these guys. And this was a team that treated us like little brothers for years and years. And I, I remember thinking like, we had never talked about that. We had never talked about, Hey man, in a couple years, we're going to be better than so-and-so or they're, they're on us now, but, but you know, later on we're, we're going to be past these guys. It, that kid, um, uh, he had just worked hard every day. He worked, he had, you know, stayed focused on the task at hand every day. Um, you know, dumped the tank for the program and his teammates. And then he was able to look up as a senior and say, wait a second, like stuff that people thought was impossible is now possible. Um, and it, it, that just really resonated with me, man. Like, like it, it, that kid, he, he wasn't a pie in the sky kid that was always talking about his goals. He just made plans and he ended up being a heck of a player for us on a really good team. So that's the one that maybe sticks with me the most. Yeah, that, that's incredible. The way you're able to turn around this team, and it really comes from you as a coach. You were able to do a stellar job to kind of incorporate and implement those core values into the player's mindset, and you are able to accomplish bigger things than were, what were ever expected. Well, I, that's flattering, Kevin. I, I'll, uh, let me be the, the first to say, like, we had a really special group of players. You know, that it's not – it's all about getting the whole mix right. And part of that's the coach, but, you know, the message really landed with those guys. And um, that's um, – you know, I'm still really close with all those guys, and that's a really special group. Um, so I, I think you got to give credit where credit's due there. But, um, yeah, it's just about getting the right people together, man. Like, you know, I'm – I'll be the first to admit that I can't coach anybody. You know, you can't just uh, bring me a, an average 18 year old and um, I'm going to be able to do something with them. I think we're all better when we have the, the right ingredients around us. And that, you know, that kind of goes back to recruiting and finding the right guys, the, the guys that are going to fit the culture and the mindset. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a big part of it. And I want to make sure the players get the proper credit. Thank you for tuning in. If you like what you saw, Please like, comment, and subscribe to my new channel. I'll be posting more interviews with college coaches, professional players, and also drills. So make sure to click on that subscription button and get notified.